started. Good, sir. All right, we're recording. Um, so what I wanted to talk about today for the, the lecture is playing the argument. And um, what, uh, you know, near the end of last class, actually, I had questions from um, two people. Um, you know, my, my good friend Christian asked about sort of the idea of method work with, with Shakespeare and how does that translate and, uh, and is there anything different? And, I, uh, and then somebody else asked about dealing with being seeming affected on stage and how sometimes actors can seem affected in Shakespeare. Um, and I address both those questions, but they, they got me thinking and I, I wasn't sure what to lecture on this week. And um, I think a good answer to both really sort of crystallized in thinking about those questions and thinking about playing the argument, both in terms of, um, you know, if you're really doing script analysis, if you're really going into the text and looking at what Shakespeare wrote and taking all the hints, um, uh, a lot of the work we're doing is quote unquote method work. I mean, where you came from, what you want, how you're going to get it, what are the obstacles. Um, now, there's lots of exercises. Method is a broad statement, and I and I don't really have a judgment on it. I think I think whatever works for you is great. Um, uh, but um, the only thing I really had to say to to Christian, who with whom he and I were in Larry Moss's class together and Natalia Nogolich's class together, we trained for years. In, in some method work was just that, you know, in terms of direct intention, like line to line, I really don't go through and notate the scripts. Um, Shakespeare's arguments are central. This is a, you know, this is all, an, this is aural storytelling, right? A-U-R, uh, not O-R. Um, and uh, everything, I do think there is subtext in Shakespeare, but, uh, but everything we're fighting for is said. And once you hook onto that, once you, once you, drive into that, the sort of core of what you're looking for, the core of what you want to emphasize and frame for the audience can become apparent pretty quickly. So I do think that is a key. I sort of struggled with the affectation question. I do think that's a major key to a lack of affectation, um, which is just playing the argument. Um, I also think that's about not overemphasizing, which was our first lecture and which I'll be coming back to again during this lecture. Um, but also, uh, you know, we are speaking a heightened language, and hopefully we're speaking it well. Uh, there may be some people that hear an affectation in this work, no matter what. It may be unavoidable. Um, I hope not. I hope that doesn't get in anybody's way. But you know, it's also about how you define affectation. If, if sounding good is affected, then, then I'm fine being affected. Um, so, but what occurred to me in thinking about these things was really the central ne necessity of playing the argument of looking at what a character is fighting for, because every character on the stage is fighting for something. Every character comes in from the lowest messenger, whose only mission is to deliver the news, some of the most important parts in Shakespeare, um, to Hamlet. Everybody is fighting for something and fighting for an argument. And I think in Shakespeare, I, that sounds obvious, and it may be obvious, uh, but I think we get it muddled sometimes. Um, and when you look at the great actors, um, the battle axes, the ones that have been in the theater for 30, 40 years, um, you know, my brilliant friend, Scott Wentworth, uh, my, the, my men, you know, one of, one of my dearest mentors, actually all of my mentors were sort of in some version of this, where they speak it beautifully, you know, but there's nothing affected about it because they're playing the arguments and they're not overemphasizing. Those really are such key things to telling our stories and to keeping our audience's ears actively engaged with the work we're doing. So, um, you know, and, and, and for clarity's sake, I've talked about this before too, we often, in not liking pronouns, I think often the idea is that we go, go, go at pronouns under the hope that we're gonna make things clearer for the audience, and they don't. But we feel like if we hit all the he's and she's and theirs, we're going to shape it up in some way that really helps them. And it doesn't. Um, those aren't the words, those aren't the arguments. Um, sometimes pronouns play an antithesis and maybe do need a little more shaping, but pronouns are rarely the arguments. And so we're, we're aiming to target and play at the arguments. Um, and uh, so while emphasis, and this comes back to our operative stress discussion, while emphasis is key, and overemphasis is death. Often emphasis what words we choose for our operative stress, for our map, is interpretive. But in helping us weedle out maybe the best choices amongst them, um, 
asking yourself, what is the argument is a key, I think is a key question to drive you to what words you want to frame up. Um, what is the argument that I want the audience to hear? And how is the argument developing? And this also ties into last week with new ideas and discoveries. Usually an argument, well, I mean, always an argument starts in one place, but usually nine times out of 10, the character doesn't have like a, an end goal for the argument. They don't have, uh, they don't know where it's going. Their hope is to convince whoever they're talking to, whether it's themselves and the audience or another character on stage. Um, and so the interesting thing of watching them navigate either a scene or a monologue is playing through that argument, reacting to what they're getting and maneuvering around obstacles. Um, so when looking for operative words, when discussing, what do I want to frame? What is my map? A good question to help you. It's not the only question, but a good question is what is the argument? What am I fighting for? In a method sense, you could say, what is the objective? Um, and, uh, and if you key in on that, I think you'll both avoid affectation and it'll guide you uh, in the right direction of the operative words that'll serve your character's story and in so doing serve the audience's ear. Um, uh, so where does it start? Where does it end? How do you get there? Um, and, you know, it's, sometimes it's a good thing to map those things. You can think of them as beats. You could, you could do it on a, a side sheet. But to, but to map where the argument starts, where it ends, and the path by which we get there, both in terms of how the character is improvising and in terms of what they're getting back, which forces them to adjust uh, the argument. Um, so, blah, 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 blah. most of the time, well, how do I put this? Well, most of the, you know, a character knows where the argument starts and it develops as we go. Um, but in terms of what causes that argument to develop, right? So I'm talking about this map, where does it start? Where does it end? Uh, and, and now we can start talking about obstacles. So this is maybe another method term in some, in some areas, but there's always, almost never does a character walk on and get what they want. Maybe sometimes a messenger does. Um, but either through their own, there's, in, you know, they have inner obstacles and then there's exterior obstacles. So the inner obstacles are, you know, we were just working on Beatrice, right? Her, arguably an inner obstacle for her in that scene is her anger. Um, uh, it's it's getting now her righteousness is powerful and it may well help her win the argument but it's also getting in her way of sticking to the argument um, and so you know uh, anger is an inner obstacle uh, self conflict or confusion may be an inner obstacle but these are the things they're navigating and then the obvious the more obvious are the exterior obstacles which are having to convince another character um, either into your point of view or to do what you're asking them to do. Um, usually that's what you're pushing against. You know, all of Hamlet's soliloquies um, are battles with himself. So that's both inner, but also if he's placing himself out in the audience, you, you could say that's exterior as well. But he has to convince himself against his own knowledge. Beatrice has to convince Benedict to kill Claudio. Uh, we're going to look at Portia later tonight. She has to convince her husband to tell her what the fuck is wrong uh, in the uh, Portia Brutus scene. But she knows, you know, but she knows that her obstacle is going to be his idea of stoicism. So how does she work around that? So she, so part of her approach has to be starting her argument as reasonably as possible. So we're getting ahead of ourselves, but, um, you know, Luciana, we were looking at the comedy of Eros scene. Luciana is trying to convince Adriana to calm down and come have dinner. That's the exterior obstacle, but she may, as we discussed in the scene, she may have an interior obstacle of the fact that she's in love with Adriana's husband uh, and is having to navigate that. Um, so making the argument is always coming back to what they're fighting for. This is gonna get muddled by, these, by all these obstacles. Uh, and as you navigate it, you're constantly fighting to get back to the argument, get back to the argument and mapping what gets in your way uh, and what works? Where do you where do you win your points? Um, and so you know, a lot of the times when I say new idea, new idea, new idea, it'll be something where sometimes you can say a line, and the whole sort of point of the argument is wrapped up there. But there's another line that follows that that expands the argument. So what starts that? Maybe the character you're speaking to doesn't give you the reaction you want. 
maybe inspiration strikes you. Uh, you know, we're going to look at Juliet later uh, tonight. Uh, and, you know, she, she, in a way, sometimes things run away from you. Sometimes you have a character like Falstaff who can't help but going on tangents and they don't actually get in the way of his argument. He just wants to set them up and he, he sort of dances with us through it. So there are all kinds of navigations. There are all kinds of maneuvering through an argument. Um, but I think a, a key to the storytelling and playing is to consistently come back to the argument, back to the argument, always asking ourselves, uh, what is the argument? What am I emphasizing to clarify it? Um, so obstacles, interior and exterior, we have tangents. Um, so why is this harder in Shakespeare? Why do we, this seems like a really simple thing, but I, I can't tell you how many times I've seen it. I'm sure you, you have all seen it. Where you see, you see decent Shakespeare on stage and you just don't know what anybody's fighting for. You just don't know what, what the stakes are. Um, and I think it's twofold. I think it's both a modern misconception of his work this idea that um, something as basic and human can get lost in this sort of structured heightened language. Um, but on the note of heightened language, I also think his poetry, which is part of what makes his work great, is also uh, you know, an obstacle to us in, uh, in sometimes playing to the argument um, because we get lost in the poetry. We get lost in sounding beautiful. We get lost in our own voices. We get lost in trying to impress people with it. And it doesn't serve Shakespeare and, I, and it doesn't serve us. And, it cert and I don't think it serves the audience in trying to follow what's actually going on, what these characters are fighting for, what they need, what their stakes are. So I realize I'm playing around on the same theme a lot of what do we want? What are we, how are we fighting for it? How do we get it? Um, but this exists very, you know, this is the core of drama. It, you know, uh, one person wants one thing, one person wants another, and, and what happens between them is conflict. Um, or two people want the same thing, but the world doesn't want them to have it. And so what happens is conflict, right? So, um, so returning, always returning to the argument. And often when I'm encouraging new ideas, uh, discoveries, it's a character navigating their argument or getting distracted from their argument um, or somebody else convincing them of their own argument. But we're always navigating the wants and needs of the characters. Again, it sounds basic, but I think we get lost in it. Um, so I want to talk about poetry for a minute. Poetry may well be the subject of, an, of another lecture. Um, so I don't, want to, I don't want to go too far down the rabbit hole on it. Uh, but there are some things to say about it, which are, you know, you want to keep, you want to keep the poetry active um, and connected to the argument um, instead of letting yourself get lost in it. And I will have an example for this. I'm going to look at Titania's speech in Midsummer uh, in, a little, in a second here. Um, instead of letting yourself get lost in it, constantly using it to return to the argument, return to the argument. What's gonna be interesting about looking at Titania's speech is the core of her argument actually happens in about three to four verse lines. She makes her point in about three to four verse lines. But we have about a 20 to 22, page, a 20 to 22 line speech of poetry. Um, and I think there's a reason for that poetry, but I also think when we're not focused on it in the right way, it distracts us from our argument. Um, so, you know, poetry is rarely, if ever, there for its own sake. So regarding the argument, what is it there for? I think poetry is there to expand the world. Poetry expands and encompasses more of the world. It makes every argument more universal. Uh, it draws us to the heavens. It connects us to the heavens and the hells. You know, Shakespeare's globe had the gods around the circle of its top. Below was always hell. Um, you know, uh, this is another thing that Scott talks a lot about. You know, it, it, Shakespeare works both on horizontal and vertical levels, right? So he's playing in our world and he's playing to the heavens and the hells. He's play, so he's working in a world of myth. Now, we don't really work in that kind of world much anymore, which is awful. And I think it's one of the things we gravitate towards Shakespeare for. Um, and to these great writers for, because it appeals not to just to individuals, but to an encompassing sense of us as a people as, uh, 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 and the souls of us as a people. So that's what poetry is for, is to expand the language beyond the individual uh, and to expand the argument. And if you can expand an argument to, to make it universal, your argument is stronger, right? You, it does more for you. Um, 
And so without going down, I don't want to go down more of a rabbit hole on poetry. I do think there will be a separate uh, lecture on it, maybe next week, and, and maybe these can sort of twin. Um, but the last thing I'll say about it, and I want to be careful in saying this, but in a way you can leave the poetry alone. In a way you can let the poetry take care of itself. Now, that's not entirely true. You need to new mint coin images. You need to take ownership of it. You need to make it individual to your performance. You want it deeply rooted, et cetera, et cetera. But in terms of focusing on the argument, often you can let the poetry take care of itself. If you stay focused on the argument, you'll be surprised at how well great poetry does, all, does much of its own work, um, if that makes sense. So, you know, in conclusion to the sort of basic premise, every character on stage is fighting for something. This seems basic. I think we get it lost. It gets lost in Shakespeare sometimes. Everybody's fighting for something. I think often the mediocre performances you see, besides overemphasis, which is key number one to boring Shakespeare, uh, it's just lack of stakes. People not knowing what they're actually fighting for. The, the lines might say it, but they haven't, they haven't made it a part of their performance and they haven't made it a part of how they're shaping the verse. So what are you fighting for and how are you gonna get it? Uh, and then the obstacles that take place between the beginning and the end. Every character has them and every character is dealing with them in the play, the drama, the stakes, or what happened in between. Um, so that's playing the argument. Um, and, uh, and I want, as an example, we're gonna look at uh, Titania and this, super heavy speech of poetry. I'm gonna share a link. This is act one, scene two of, this is act one, scene two of Midsummer. Um, the link is now in the chat. Um, and we'll scroll down to, uh, these are the forgeries of jealousy. So I wanna look at this. A, it's famous. B, most of you have probably seen it a dozen times, maybe, maybe certainly cut a bit, although I don't think you need to, but uh, most productions do. Um, but it is, a, it is a speech filled with imagery and poetry. It's gorgeous. Uh, but it's also, she's also making a very, very specific argument. And that argument um, is that you're, she's, you know, she's being accused of infidelity by Oberon, which is hip both hypocritical because he has also committed adultery, but also because he's getting off the point, he wants the changeling boy. He wants, he wants it as a prize. And, um, and this argument has, is destroying the world. It's literally destroying the seasons. And she's arguing that, you know, the base argument, well, I, you'll hear it. Hopefully you'll, you'll hear it. I'm gonna try to read this really targeting the argument. And maybe sometimes, tossing the poetry away more than you would want to were you performing it. But it's a good example speech for hearing where the poetry could get in the way. If you let yourself get lost in it, the entire point can get washed away. But Titania is making a very specific argument and I'm gonna try in this reading, and clearly I've never played Titania, um, although I, I'd like to. Um, uh, you'll, see, you'll see how easy it is to get lost in the argument, especially by the thickness of this poetry. But uh, hopefully you'll also hear the argument as I sort of target it. Um, so he's accused her of uh, indiscretion. And she says, these are the forgeries of jealousy. And never since the middle summer spring met we on hill in dale, forest or mead, by paved fountain or by rushy brook, or in the beached margin in, of the sea to dance our ringlets to the whistling wind, but with thy brawls thou hast disturbed our sport. Therefore the winds, piping to us in vain, as in revenge, have sucked up from the sea contagious fogs, which falling in the land, have every pelting river made so proud that they have overborne their continents. The ox hath therefore stretched his yoke in vain, the plowman lost his sweat, and the green corn hath rotted ere his youth attained a beard. The fold stands empty in the drowned field, and crows are fatted with the murian flock. The nine man's morris is filled up with mud, and the quaint mazes in the wanton green, for lack of tread, 
are undistinguishable. The human mortals want their winter here. No night is now with him or Carol blessed. Therefore the moon, the governess of floods, pale in her anger, washes all the air that rheumatic diseases do abound. And through this distemperature, we see the seasons alter. Hoary-headed frosts, far in the fresh lap of the crimson rose. And an old hymn's thin and icy crown, an odorous chaplet of sweet summer buds, is as in mockery set. The spring, the summer, the childing autumn, angry winter, change their wanted liveries. And the mazed world, by their increase, now knows not which is which. And this same progeny of evils comes from our debate, from our dissension. We are their parents and original. So hopefully, I hope you heard it. It was a go. Um, this gorgeous length of poetry is an example to the damage that he is doing by causing these brawls, by fighting over this child. But the argument of the speech, maybe you could make that in about five or six lines. You could cut that down to about five or six lines and you'd have the argument. Um, so the poetry is vital. It's necessary. It's part of what makes Shakespeare great. It expands the world. We're not just talking about an argument of a man and a woman over a child. We're talking about the world is literally going fucking insane because we can't agree on this. And so the poetry is vital and necessary, but it can also be an obstacle to you as an actor in staying connected to your argument and making choices that always support the argument. Um, so uh, I hope that all made sense. Um, are there any follow-up questions? Uh, are there any follow-up questions to that? If you have them, please, uh, please just hit the raise hand option in the participants list. If there is anyone. No? I mean, pretty, pretty simple, pretty clear. Again, this is, I think on some of these lectures, it's gonna sound basic. Um, I think A, reminders are always helpful. And B, uh, in Shakespeare, we get lost sometimes with these ideas of poetry or verse or, some sort of higher calling. And I do think, I don't want to shit on that. I do think there is a, a beautiful, sort of beautiful higher calling to working on Shakespeare at times. But these, you know, part of his genius in painting us these incredible human beings was painting them honestly. And that uh, even these fairy queens and kings are, are really desperately fighting for something when they're on the stage, um, which is the core both of comedy and tragedy. Um, okay. If there's no questions, very good. The last thing I'll say, I'm gonna share a link for the East Coasters. Take five minutes after class and watch it. For the West Coasters, enjoy it on a break if you want. I'm gonna share Orson Welles' Falstaff from the Dean Martin Show. It is uh, a masterpiece of building an argument. And not only is it a masterpiece of building an argument, it's a masterpiece of watching a master working text and working tangents. And he does it all while he gets into costume. And it's amazing to think about the fact that this was on late night TV. You know, I, he was doing fall staff on late night TV. It's just mind boggling. So uh, I think it's a wonderful example. I even thought about doing a shared screen thing, but uh, you know, the technology intimidates me. Um, oh, I do have a question from Alexandra. Hi, Alexandra, it's nice to see you. I'm glad you're in class. Um, so I'm sharing this. Uh, speak Shakespeare as though it's organic to them versus actors who feel like they're spouting Shakespeare in terms of craft. Um, good, so I'm sharing the link right now. So the question, what is it that you think separates actors who are able to speak Shakespeare as though it's organic to them versus actors who feel like they're spouting Shakespeare in terms of craft? And I think, Alexandra, this is um, similar to, well, not similar, but I think it ties into my initial talk about affectation in terms of First of all, experience. Look, the, the, the earlier you are with this kind of heightened language, the more, the more slightly affected it's gonna sound, the harder it's gonna get. But once you've put in enough work, as long as you're not overemphasizing and you're not adding a lilt or a sort of faux British accent to it, and you're fighting for your arguments, it may take time, it may take building of the craft and the tools of Shakespeare, but I think, I think anybody that might feel like they're spouting, or if you heard somebody sort of spouting Shakespeare, this sort of affected, poetic 
expulsion. Um, if they can, if they can tone down any sort of bad accent, don't overemphasize and target your arguments. You will work your way out of that affectation. Um, I, I hope I hope that's clear. Um, so I threw the link up. Uh, please watch it and enjoy. It's a it's a small masterpiece uh, for the. Uh, okay, good. I'm glad for the. Uh, for the East Coasters, uh, unless you want to stick around, which you're welcome to do, thank you so much. Uh, the, again, for payment, the Venmo link and uh, PayPal stuff is on the signature in the email. Uh, it was a really wonderful class. Thank you to everybody that worked for your uh, craft and your bravery. Um, uh, all right. Um, I think, Will, I think